Imagine a fighter plane so advanced it could outpace its legendary predecessor by 100 miles per hour, a machine born to dominate the skies. Now picture it arriving a fraction too late, just as the world stopped caring. Welcome to Historical Digs. Where today, we uncover the story of the Supermarine Spiteful, a piston engine masterpiece rendered obsolete before its first flight. The Spiteful's Impossible Promise In the summer of 1942, as Spitfires dueled Luftwaffe fighters over occupied Europe, a quiet revolution brewed in a drafty Supermarine hangar. Engineers hunched over blueprints, grappling with an unthinkable task, reinventing a legend. The Spitfire, with its graceful elliptical wings and Merlin engine, had already cemented its place in aviation lore. But war, accelerated progress, and Allied intelligence reports hinted at a looming threat – German jets. If Britain's aerial dominance were to survive, Supermarine needed a fighter that could bridge the gap between propeller-driven heroics and the dawn of the jet age. The answer, they believed, lay in the spiteful a machine designed to push piston engine performance to its breaking point. The spiteful secret weapon wasn't its engine, though the Rolls-Royce Griffin alone deserved reverence. A 37-liter V12 Colossus, the Griffin spun its five-bladed propeller at 2,750 rpm, generating 2,375 horsepower, enough to move the spiteful F Mark 14 forward at 483 miles per hour. That's over 80 miles per hour faster than late war Spitfires. But raw power meant little without control. Engineers faced a paradox. To harness the Griffin's fury, they needed wings that could slice through air like never before. Their solution arrived via transatlantic inspiration the laminar flow wing. American engineers had pioneered the design for the P 51 Mustang, but Supermarine refined it into something surgical. Unlike the Spitfire's iconic elliptical wings, which created turbulent airflow at high speeds, laminar flow wings maintained smooth, layered air currents. The effect was akin to swapping a butter knife for a razor. Drag dropped by 20%, boosting speed and fuel efficiency. But perfection came at a cost. These wings demanded manufacturing precision that bordered on obsessive. Even a single misplaced rivet head or a slightly deep scratch could disrupt airflow, rendering the design useless. Supermarine's workshops became temples of exactitude, where technicians polished wing surfaces to a mirror finish and measured tolerances with micrometer gauges. Before we dig deeper into the spiteful story, hit that like button and subscribe to Historical Digs. Your support helps us unearth the lost stories of history's most ingenious war machines. Pilots soon discovered the spiteful was no Spitfire 2.0. The Griffin's torque, a brutal twist of over 2,300 horsepower, could yaw the aircraft hard left during takeoff. Pilots had to slam the rudder pedal just to keep it straight on the runway. At low speeds, the laminar wings traded lift for sleekness, making landings a harrowing ballet of precision. Test pilots reported that flying the spiteful demanded constant vigilance, with even minor errors risking disaster. The cockpit, redesigned for speed over comfort, vibrated so intensely that pilots returned with blurred vision and ringing ears. Yet for all its flaws, the spiteful hinted at brilliance. During a 1944 trial over Boscom Down, prototype NN660 hit 494 miles per hour, faster than early jets like the Messerschmitt ME262. Engineers celebrated, but frontline pilots remained skeptical. The RAF's battle-hardened veterans, wedded to the Spitfire's intuitive handling, bristled at Spiteful's temperament. According to evaluators, the Spiteful's controls were described as more unforgiving compared to the Spitfire's responsiveness. The Air Ministry took notes. In wartime, familiarity saved lives. Could they afford to retrain pilots on a fighter that demanded perfection? Supermarine pressed on, convinced the spiteful's teething issues were fixable. Engineers tweaked the wing's leading edge to improve low-speed lift and added a trim tab to tame the Griffin's torque. By early 1945, the Mark 15 prototype showed promise, but time was slipping away. Across the channel, Germany crumbled, and in secret labs, Allied engineers tinkered with turbojets. The spiteful, for all its velocity, was still a piston fighter in a world racing toward the sound barrier. What lingered was the bitter irony of its existence. 
The Spiteful had achieved what designers once deemed impossible. It married cutting-edge aerodynamics to raw piston power, bending physics to its will. Yet in doing so, it highlighted the limits of an era. This was a plane born from wartime urgency but cursed by peacetime priorities, a masterpiece without a mission. A Race Against the Jet Age by 1944, as Allied forces stormed Normandy and B-29s firebombed Tokyo, a quieter battle raged in Britain's design bureaus, the clash between pistons and jets. The spiteful, with its Griffin engine roaring at full tilt, was a marvel of mechanical evolution. But evolution was no longer enough. Revolution had arrived in the form of the Gloucester Meteor, Britain's first operational jet fighter whose later versions soared past 600 miles per hour without a propeller's constraints. For the spiteful, this wasn't just competition, it was obsolescence in real time. The Royal Air Force found itself torn. Jets promised a quantum leap in speed, but their early models were fragile fuel guzzlers. The Meteor's Derwent engines gulped kerosene, limiting its range to a mere 500 miles, half the spiteful's reach. Meanwhile, German ME-262s proved jets could dominate the skies, but Allied pilots noted their vulnerability during takeoff and landing. The spiteful, with its proven reliability and blistering speed, offered a stopgap. Some Air Ministry officials argued the spiteful could serve as a temporary solution until jets became reliable. But time was a luxury Britain no longer had. Production debates grew heated. Retooling factories to build meteors required retraining thousands of workers and reconfiguring assembly lines, a process estimated to take 18 months. Supermarine, already straining to meet Spitfire demands, faced a dilemma – pivot to jets or double down on the spiteful. The Air Ministry split the difference, placing a token order for 150 spitefuls in January 1945 and receiving a fraction of that. It was a decision rooted in doubt, not conviction. The Spiteful's advocates clung to its tactical niche. At 494 miles per hour, it could intercept V-1 flying bombs faster than any frontline fighter, a fact demonstrated in trials where a prototype NN-660 outran the pulse jet doodlebugs by 80 miles per hour. Meteors soon took over V-1 duty, but naval planners saw the Spiteful's potential too. The fleet air arm, desperate to replace obsolete sea fires, commissioned a carrier-ready variant, the Sea Fang. With reinforced landing gear and an arrestor hook, it promised to be the fastest piston-powered naval fighter ever built. But the Sea Fang's 1945 deck trials revealed fatal flaws. Its laminar flow wings, optimized for speed, generated scant lift at low speeds, a death sentence for carrier landings. Test pilots aborted 30% of approaches, and it's easy to understand why. Jets, meanwhile, advanced relentlessly. By VE Day, Meteor squadrons were regularly intercepting V-1 flying bombs. Their jet engines, free of propeller drag, gave them a clean speed advantage, though early missions were anything but easy. When a Meteor pilot maneuvered his wingtip close to a V-1s, a tactic known as tipping, the disturbed airflow sent the bomb spiraling into the channel. It was a high-stakes move that bypassed bullets with pure piloting skill. No spiteful could realistically replicate that maneuver. Its demanding handling made such delicate interceptions nearly impossible, especially when compared to the Meteor's smooth jet response. The RAF's calculus shifted. Why invest in a piston fighter that might match early jets when jets themselves were improving exponentially? Japan's surrender in August 1945 sealed the spiteful's fate. Overnight, the Air Ministry slashed its order from 150 to 19 aircraft. Supermarine's hangars, once bustling with Spitfire production, fell silent. Workers laid off tools mid-assembly. Half-finished spitefuls gathered dust. The Sea Fang fared worse. Only 18 were built and during 1946 carrier trials, one collapsed its landing gear on HMS Ocean's deck, skidding into the sea. The Admiralty quietly canceled the program, opting instead for the de Havilland Vampire, a jet that landed slower than the Sea Fang, despite having no propeller. Yet the Spiteful's demise wasn't just about technology, it was about economics. Post-war Britain teetered on bankruptcy, its defense budget slashed by 75%. Every Spiteful cost £12,000, enough to train three Meteor pilots. With Germany defeated and Japan occupied, the RAF saw no need for a high-performance piston interceptor. Even the Spiteful's vaunted speed became irrelevant. 
In 1947, a modified Meteor F4 hit 616 miles per hour, shattering the Spiteful's records. Supermarine's engineers, pragmatic to the end, scavenged their creation's best parts. The laminar flow wings and Griffin engine found new life in the attacker, Britain's first jet naval fighter. A poetic case of cannibalizing the past to feed the future. What lingers is the Spiteful's paradox. It was both ahead of time and outdated. A fighter too advanced for its era, yet not advanced enough. Its tragedy lay in timing, born into a world that had already moved on. Legacy of a Ghost Fighter The Spiteful's epitaph might read, too late, but its influence seeped into the bones of aviation history, shaping designs long after its retirement. Unlike the Spitfire, which became a symbol of triumph, the spiteful lingered as a cautionary muse, a reminder that innovation without timing is a symphony play to an empty hall. Yet in its quiet demise, it gifted the future fragments of its brilliance. The most tangible legacy lay in its wings. The laminar flow design, once dismissed as finicky, became foundational to the jet age. It is rumored that in 1946, North American aviation engineers studying spiteful blueprints adapted its wing profile for the F-86 Sabre. The result? A fighter that dominated Korean skies, outmaneuvering MiG-15s with ease. The Sabre's edge came from a borrowed genius, a subtle nod to Supermarine's orphaned innovation. While the Vampire followed a different design path, its sleek wing fuselage blending echoed the era's shared obsession with aerodynamic purity a goal the Spiteful had pushed to piston-powered extremes. Then there was the Griffin engine. Though the Spiteful never saw combat, its power plant found post-war glory in the unlikeliest of arenas, air racing. Though the S6B never flew again after its 1931 triumph, the Griffin engine it helped inspire found new life in post-war air racing, powering modified Spitfires and Sea Furies that roared past 500 miles per hour at events like the National Air Races. Pilots marveled at its banshee scream as it hurtled past 520 miles per hour, a final ironic hurrah for an engine designed for war. But the Spiteful's true afterlife lay in its role as a test bed. Engineers cannibalized surviving airframes to solve riddles that jets posed. One prototype, stripped of its wings, became a high-speed sled at Farnborough, testing ejection seat limits. Another, its fuselage crammed with sensors, helped refine cockpit pressurization systems for the Comet, the world's first jet airliner. Even the attacker, Britain's inaugural carrier-based jet, owed its existence to the spiteful. Designers grafted its wings onto a new fuselage, creating a hybrid that bridged eras. Rumors persist of a second airframe in private storage, possibly RB-518, but its condition and existence remain uncertain. The Spiteful's philosophical legacy cuts deeper. It became a textbook case of technological lock-in, studied by engineers and economists alike. For many, the Spiteful's story became proof that superior technology doesn't always guarantee success, not when infrastructure, training, and politics anchor an industry to the status quo. Post-war Japan internalized this lesson. When designing the 1960s-era Mitsubishi F1, engineers prioritized incremental upgrades over radical leaps, wary of repeating Supermarine's gamble. Ironically, the Spiteful's greatest tribute came from an adversary. Soviet engineers reportedly studied captured Spiteful airframes to improve their own jet designs. Yet for all its echoes in later machines, the Spiteful remains a ghost, a machine adrift from its intended timeline. It wasn't a failure, but a stepping stone that nobody stepped on. Progress isn't just about building the future, it's about building it at the right time. But what do you think? Was the spiteful a visionary design or a relic chasing relevance? Let us know your take in the comments below. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell to join us on the next historical dig. Until then, remember, history is full of hidden gems if you know where to dig.